in the bulletin this morning. I'm just doing 1 Timothy, but those same qualities for a pastor are found in Titus chapter 1. And I wanted to make sure that you understand that those same qualities, uh, for the most part, are required of your average Christian. So I went into Romans chapter 12 and listed how that the average Christian is also to exhibit these kinds of qualities. And I thank you for uh, following the message this morning because what we're talking about, the qualities that we're looking for in Pastor Next. Pastor Next is going to be a man of God. He's going to hold biblical values. Now, Pastor Next, however, will not be perfect. Did you, are you surprised? <laughs> I had an IRS agent in my Long Beach church, and on several occasions he told me he never did an audit where he couldn't find something wrong. Never once did he do an audit that he could not find an error in the taxpayer's uh, submission. And likewise, we, uh, we can look at a guy so hard and obsess on a minor shortcoming and think that that speaks to his whole character. And that's not true. So we're going to look at these biblical qualifications, recognizing that nobody uh, fits them perfectly. However, a pastor must aspire to a higher standard. Why is that? Because the pastor is the example. And so as the example, for example, an example of hospitality, you know, every Christian should be hospitable, but the pastor has to be especially hospitable. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So if the pastor fails in some social nicety, we need to give him some grace. However, we have to be careful that that social faux pas is not an example of a deeper character issue. And that's the job of the search team. As a matter of fact, the search team will be using what is called blind references. You know, any, you can get all six of your best friends to lie, you every, lie for you every day. But what we do is we talk to the primary references and then ask them, is there someone else that we should talk to who knows this pastor well? Now, his friend might be hesitant to give a bad report on his friend, but wanting to be honest, he ends up giving a blind reference who's got the scoop on that pastor that he did not want to divulge. And so those blind references are, are very important. The first quality that we have here in your uh, slides has to do with the above reproach, above reproach. And uh, I remember when I was a young pastor, I had a bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus. Any of you ever have that bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus? Am I the only nerd in the audience? I'm... <laughs> and I soon found out, honk if you love Jesus, for the most part, to other drivers, communicate something they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear random beeps on the freeway, right? And so I made it my... Uh, goal from then on, never to have a bumper sticker, religious, political, of any kind, because people would end up judging the church, end up judging pastors, uh, end up judging Christians based upon a very limited amount of information, uh, giving that one time in my life I cut someone off in traffic. <laughs> Here, we don't want anyone to think badly of the church, and that's why uh, this quality above reproach is important. And in the cultural narrative of today, this is very difficult because the gospel narrative has to do with absolute truth. The cultural narrative right now is very strong on uh, relativity. Now, the, the bridge, I believe, is kindness. When we give what we be, believe to be the absolute biblical truth, we have to be careful to be kind. And it's also, I think, helpful to be self-effacing. By that, I mean this. When you end up telling them that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, that no one comes to the Father but through Jesus, of course, that is absolutely accurate. And then usually I, I put an addendum on that says, and I tell you, that's very important for me because I am such a sinner 
without Jesus being my way, without Jesus being my truth, without Jesus being my life, I would be lost forever. And so you give the truth, there is salvation and no other name. And boy, that's good for me because I could never own my salvation. I can't do it. I cannot work my way into heaven. And so what you allow is for grace and kindness to come through rather than the uh, harshness of turn or burn or be dipped or be damned. Uh, have you been bathed in the blood, brother? Those things, although they may be true, are unnecessarily alienating people from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Above reproach has to do with intersecting the community with uh, kindness is what it amounts to. The second characteristic there is the husband of one wife. And the, the, I always like to have uh, a question for a candidate that is on the behavior level. Now, the husband of one wife, uh, many good scholars that I agree with believe this is a one-woman kind of man is the flavor of that phrase. So I ask these guys, uh, how do you show your love for your wife? No, no, I, do you love your wife? Yes. I see it tells you nothing. Can you give me something that you do every week that shows your love for your wife. It might be something like a date night. It might be something like getting a, or writing her a note about how much you love her. I want to know what behavior that he has that shows his love for his wife. And this uh, basically also requires, you know, uh, married only once. Now, I could give you a theoretical scenario where we could look at a divorced pastor. However, it involves so much background checking and so much difficulty that I will encourage the search team not to look for a divorced person, even though they may have had grounds for divorce and the divorce may have been 20 years ago and the divorce may have been before they became a Christian. I mean, it's possible to hire a divorced pastor. However, it's just too much uh, homework for the average person. And definitely, uh, the idea behind this pastor is he has demonstrable love for his wife. The next quality here in your outline is sober-minded, which uh, some translate uh, temperate. He's got to be serious about his faith. And the one area that I look in for most in terms of sober-minded is he is serious about prayer. Can you tell me about your personal prayer life? Can you tell me about group prayer meetings that you go to? Can you tell me about praying with your family? And so you sort of see whether or not he's serious about his faith because the easiest thing in the world is, is to uh, talk a good game without actually playing a good game. And we don't want to have a person who talks about prayer who doesn't actually uh, do prayer. He's a sober-minded, level-headed kind of person. And I really want to know his personal discipline in prayer. Uh, boy, I have gone to maybe, no exaggeration, several hundred prayer meetings. And it's hard to get down to deep business with God at a public prayer meeting, even if it's only four or five people. It's difficult to get down to business, your business, what, what you need to talk to God about. And so that personal prayer life is really reflective of that sober, uh, serious Christianity which we want. The next characteristic here is not a drunkard. And the literal translation would be something like not addicted to wine. There is a letter written by a church father in 300 AD where he talks about, I was wrong, I was a drunkard last night, and I abused the brethren. And this is the problem for people who overindulge in alcohol is that they end up saying things or doing things that they would not do if they were sober. Now, an important question for a church like Laurelwood, where we have uh, people who are teetotalers, who feel like it is unwise to drink alcohol in any proportion, and then on the other side, we have people that have wine with dinner every night. Now, what kind of a question would you ask a candidate with, with that sort of extremes? Well, what I would ask him is, how would you handle that situation? I used to be on an ordination council where we interviewed potential pastors, and 
on this question of alcohol, are you an abstainer or not? And no matter which way they wanted, what I wanted to hear was their biblical rationale for their position. You see, it's not so much that the teetotalers are absolutely right or the wine drinkers are absolutely right. What I want to know is has that pastor formed his convictions based upon what the Bible says as opposed to pressure or uh, cultural convenience? Not a drunkard, uh, and it's interesting here that in these uh, four phrases that are found here, not a drunkard, not aggressive, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, this would transfer over to our secular culture. I mean, how many companies want to hire an executive who is a violent, greedy drunk? I mean, even a secular culture does not want to hire that kind of leader. So it's important that the search team investigate these characteristics because he wants to be above reproach. The next characteristic is self-control. And self-control has to do uh, with not addicted. In other words, not a drunkard. Self-control has to do with addiction to anything. You can be addicted to prescription drugs. You can be uh, addicted to uh, recreational marijuana. You can be addicted to, you can be addicted to food. You, you can be addicted to movies. In other words, it is a self-control thing that when necessary, you can put aside any behavior and exercise self-control and do what needs to be done. It's, it, and so what I would say, and this uh, self-control has a lot to do with patience. You know, Lord, Lord, grant me patience and hurry up about it. You know, it's, And the patience uh, works itself out in this way. We, in terms of asking the candidate a question. How have you learned patience in light of unreasonable congregational expectations? Now, let me tell you, this is a key question for a pastor because uh, the expectations of the congregation for a pastor are just all over the map. And he cannot meet all the expectations, therefore, some people are going to be disappointed some of the time that the pastor cannot do the action or the behavior that they want. So in that situation, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, John Maxwell, one of my heroes, uh, I had the privilege of knowing John for a year in San Diego when he was at Skyline Wesley and went out for lunch several times. And he told me about this lady that every Sunday she came up with a complaint. Every Sunday, that was, he called, he called her Mrs. Complaint. And, and he would stand there and he'd listen to her for a couple of minutes. And then he would say, Mrs. Complaint, I just want you to know I love you. And he put his arms around her and hug her. You know, we have to love people. And if you love them, they will uh, put up with the fact that the pastor is not possible to meet all expectations. The pastor uh, has to have social IQ. Social IQ, by that I mean he needs to understand the reality of social relationships. I remember my first church where I was the associate pastor and I was supervising junior high, senior high, college, singles, and young marrieds. Five different groups were under my belt. And so when I went through the church lobby, I was on a mission every time, zoom, zoom, zoom. And I'd been there just a couple of weeks and Pastor Thomas called me aside and he said, Dennis, you got to walk slowly through the lobby. Some of the best advice I ever got because when you rush by people, they think you don't care, you're not interested, you don't know who they are, whatever. Walk slowly through the lobby. And you have to ask questions that help discern what is this guy's social IQ. The next characteristic here is respectable. Every person has a right to their opinion, and you should respect their opinion. It's not that people are always right. It's that there is a facet of their opinion that's true. And one of the great uh, uh, opportunities 
for change is showing that you respect the past of a church. You know, we're not here this morning based upon only our sacrifice. We're here this morning based upon 25 years of sacrifice. And people sacrifice greatly to get this property and build these buildings and keep these buildings up. Great sacrifice led to what we enjoy. And by respecting the past, by, by pointing out the uh, integrity of the church over many years, that is the foundation for change. You can't just say, okay, we're going to change this right now, and it's like disregarding what everyone thinks. And that's why we've done more surveys than you wanted to fill out, <laughs> because we're trying to respect what the opinion of everyone is. Now, obviously, cannot meet everyone's expectation, but in the main, expectations should be met. Um, yeah, I think I see you. Back here, Dennis, where are you? Respectable. Honoring the past while offering change for the future. This is uh, not stepping on toes unnecessarily. Uh, I have to watch my mouth all the time because when I hear a complaint that is naive or even wrong, my tendency is to knock them down, show them where the truth is. I have to watch that. God wants us to be patient as pastors, not edgy, not rascals. And then uh, respectable here in your outline, hospitable, hospitable. Uh, hospitable has to do with one of the great promises of Scripture, hospitable. In Hebrews, I think it's 13, 2, it says, some of you has, have entertained angels unaware. So you want to meet an angel? You better start entertaining strangers because that's the promise, that we inadvertently entertain angels unaware. And so the pastor has to be uh, tuned in to new people. It's a very strong theme of the Old Testament that Israel was to be kind to strangers and, and open their tent to strangers. And we've lost a little bit of that in that church today because Americans are so independent and we, we like our isolation because isolation is easy, easier. We need to be more gregarious. Like the Filipino people, there's a gregarious group of people. Like the Indian people, there's a gregarious group of people. We need to be hospitable. We need to reach out to people. Take them out for lunch. Take them out for coffee. Take them out in such a situation where they feel welcome. A climate of hospitality is important in a church. And a, a candidate question might be something like, uh, how have you instilled a spirit of hospitality in the church? How, how have you done that? And it can be, and, and he could give several examples if he's in tune with hospitality. And then what was his role in, in, in establishing an atmosphere of hospitality in the church? Making people feel welcome, especially uh, those who may not fit the demographic of the church, it's even more important to make them feel welcome. Because what you're doing when you make a stranger feel welcome, that's the first step in the gospel, that you're interested in them, and by being interested in them, they sense that, and then you begin to ask the question, what part of the gospel do they need to hear? Able to teach, this is uh, 1 Timothy 3.2. Now this, able to teach, was the strongest response from the congregational survey. You want to have a man of God who can teach the word of God in an intelligent and simple way. I, and boy, I totally sympathize with that. Uh, the word here, uh, apt to teach, is actually a very unique Greek word only occurring one time in the New Testament. And the word is heterodisdasko. I know that you've been waiting all morning to hear that word. <laughs> and heterodisdasko has to do with someone who's able to teach against a different doctrine, okay? 
And so the idea here is that this teacher should be so solid in the Word of God, he's able to spot teaching that is contrary to the Word of God. And a question for a candidate might be this, how have you corrected doctrinal error in your church? Because it's always there. And give, maybe give an example. And uh, I'll give you three or four examples from my own ministry. I had a guy that believed in soul sleep, that when you died, you were not resurrected until Christ's second coming. And this is a doctrine that impacts a guy's eschatology, which is uh, important. So uh, I was able to convince this guy not to surrender his doctrine of soul sleep, which is a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, by the way, but I was able to convince him never to mention that in his teaching, and we were able to get along. Uh, another error is uh, someone was teaching that uh, when you become a Christian, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you must speak in tongues. And of course, this is contrary to Scripture. You can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. And so I was able to help this uh, teacher uh, to stay out of the glossolalia a component of his teaching. This uh, is important that we have someone that is able to defend from Scripture, and in our case, the doctrinal statement of faith that Laura Wood uh, Baptist Church holds. Um, If he's apt to teach, he ought to be able to talk about his sermon preparation. What do you do for your sermon preparation? And listen to him. How does he prepare for his sermons? Uh, does he use the Greek and the Hebrew? Uh, does he have a systematic approach? Does he teach expositionally? Does he teach books of the Bible or does he teach topics or both? And so there are several questions that can be asked that will reveal the flavor of his teaching if he were to come here to Laurelwood and what it might look like in the long term. You can't really tell much about a guy's teaching in the short term because in the short term, it, you know, it might be a topical series. In the long term, he might stay in the book of Romans for, I think it was Martin Lloyd Jones stayed in Romans for five years. A little too long in one book, I think. But uh, we need to understand that he needs to be a capable teacher. He can spot error, he can correct error. And he knows the doctrinal position of Laura Wood and would not vary from that. Then not violent. This uh, seems uh, to be an odd characteristic. I mean, who's going to call a pastor who's involved in fistfights? I mean, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not going to call him. But this uh, not violent has more to do with not being aggressive. You, you, you can find a person whose countenance is there ready to fight over every doctrine at the drop of a hat. And sometimes talking to a person is much, in private is much more important than public rebuke. It would only be public rebuke in the sense that it was essential uh, to rebuke him publicly. And that's what, uh, oh, I said, Timothy or Titus says, that only after two or three warnings, then you would rebuke him or her publicly. After two or three warnings warnings. Not violent. And of course, this is right in line with the teaching of Jesus Christ. How is that? Well, think about what Christ said with respect to his enemies. And you'll see right away that violence towards our enemies is not appropriate. Christ said, and I'll quote these in a row, love your enemies, serve them, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who seek to take advantage of you and pray for those that hurt you. So uh, he is not going to be involved in making, uh, he's not involved in persecuting his enemies, he's involved in praying for his enemies, whoever they might be. So one question is sort of fun. When was the last time you lost your temper? Now, you know, if he's a real mature guy, it might be five or ten years ago. But I want an illustration of how did he lose his temper. And mine was last time was in traffic. And I don't know, it must be ten years ago now. <laughs> and, and, and then what did you do about it? Well, I went to my wife for counsel. And she told me that uh, 
You just have to lower the expectations. You know, people are not all conscientious drivers. And when you lower your expectations, you're less critical and less likely to bump somebody else's bumper. <laughs> and then gentle, which is, of course, a, an immediate uh, link to this previous characteristic of not violent, gentle. And I think gentle has to do with personal counsel. People come to you and you have to be careful not to drop your bucket in their thimble. So a person comes to you and they're grieving and you, sh you don't say, well, don't you believe that your loved one is in heaven? No, that's not gentle whatsoever. That's, that's caustic, that's aggressive, that's rough. You don't want to say something like that. And so, uh, in essence, the uh, basis of this gentleness is, how can I be kind and answer this person's question without making them feel like a noosh? You know, you, you have to love them and help them rather than being harsh or uh, uh, difficult. And now, and a, and a caution, I'd want to hear this from a potential candidate is, you, you talk to someone, you're talking to someone who's got a problem, and it becomes evident that they have an emotional problem. They're schizophrenic, or they're obsessive or compulsive. That, and the seminary training gives you the ability to diagnose this stuff, but not treat it, okay? So I can tell someone is schizophrenic, it's, it's, it's very easy to do. I can tell an obsessive compulsive, I could tell a paranoid. However, it's above my pay grade. I, I, I am not to be a professional counselor for people with these kinds of emotional health issues. And so I, want, I would want to hear a candidate say, well, after I have determined that they're out of my league, they're above my pay grade, then I refer to a Christian counselor. And one of the first things Pastor Next will want to know is who are some of the Christian professional counselors in Vancouver that I can refer a needy person to. And, and, so, and you have to be very careful when you do this because it can sound like, oh, you don't want to talk to me, Pastor, or you don't want to counsel me, Pastor. That's not the case. The analogy is this. Uh, a general MD family internist practitioner can diagnose that you have heart problems. It's not that difficult that you have heart problems. However, you don't want your GP, general internist practitioner, doing heart surgery. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, interestingly enough, you may not know this, it is legal for a GP practitioner to do heart surgery, but you don't want it. <laughs> Believe me, you want a heart surgeon who has a 99% success rate, not a general practitioner who probably have you die on the table. <laughs> and so, uh, as a counselor, I'm not going to be able to help that schizophrenic, the obsessive compulsive, the neurotic, the, the uh, obsessive person. I can't help them in the long term. They need an emotional heart surgeon. And so I want to hear that that pastor is wise enough that when he's uh, in deep water, he knows how to refer and, and how he would refer. He's not, he's not un insensitive to the fact that he cannot do long-term counseling in terms of time and cannot do long-term counseling in terms of uh, expertise. Then the next characteristic here in 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, not quarrelsome. You know where quarrels come from, don't you? Pride. I know what's right, Gwen, and you don't. <laughs> and we don't say that out loud, but in our heart we're thinking, if they read the websites that I read, if they read the articles that I read, they would have exactly the same opinion as I do. Well, I'm not an MD, so when I go into a medical website and I read what some physician has said about a particular illness, I'm a novice reading an expert. And as you know, sometimes experts contradict each other. And therefore, which one's right? Well, you need to recognize that uh, you're arrogant if you think without training you can make medical decisions. And that pride that leads to quarreling will 
damage your ministry because you end up becoming arrogant. You think you know more than everyone else and you, <laughs> you better recognize your limitations. A smart pastor knows what he's dumb at, right? He knows where he has failed to read the amount of literature necessary to make a quality decisions. Then not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. And so for a potential pastor next, we might ask him, can we do a credit check? Or might do it without his permission. I believe you can do it even without his permission. And then the question that's most interest to me about pastor next, not a, not a lover of money, I want to hear how he has grown in his own personal stewardship. Uh, as I've been rifling through potential guys that might be qualified that I'm going to recommend to the search team, I, I thought about one guy, and I called a senior pastor who had worked with him when he was a youth pastor. And I said, tell me about this guy. And he said, well, he's a pretty good guy, but he does have one fault. And, and, he, and I said, what's that? He never gave a nickel to the church in the whole time he served here. Disqualified. It's, it's over. He cannot uh, be a candidate. So I want to hear from that pastor his stewardship journey. I know when I was 15 years old, I'd throw a buck in the plate, and I thought I was doing a big deal. And then when I became a, I became a member, I started chipping in $10. And then uh, as I began to grow in my faith, I began to understand that tithe is not a law. It's a principle. Uh, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek before the law. And of course, the law teaches tithing, uh, three different levels of tithing. And then Christ, he's the one that confronted the Pharisees time and time again. One time he said, you Pharisees do well because you tithe, mint, cumin, and dill. He even commended the Pharisees tithing. So obviously, tithing is a good principle. And Gwen and I, as, as the Lord provided us income, we began to practice tithing. And I thought, that was it. We're done. No. God wants you to be a faith giver, which is above your tithe. And you need to make that agreement with God. If you believe this project, financial project, is of God, God, if you get it to me, you'll get it through me. And you'll see ways where God has blessed you that will allow you to give uh, far above the tithe. But money is such an important component of these characteristics. You know, because uh, debt is a prison. If you're deeply in debt, it really limits your uh, stewardship possibilities. And generosity will give you life. You'll feel great about being generous to the cause of Jesus Christ. So stewardship is a very important component. And then this next one here... Uh, a good manager of his own household. Now, this seems sort of odd, but indeed, if, if you can't manage your own home where your wife respects you and your children obey you, how can you manage the church of God? The analogy here is very strong because you have your personal family and then you have the church family. If you can't manage your personal family, it's going to be difficult to be faithful in managing God's family. And so one of the questions on this is, uh, are all your children believers? Now, this is an important question because it might be that one of them is not a believer. I think of Dr. Ray Stedman at Peninsula Bible Church, a great Bible teacher. He had four children. When they became adults, one of them defected from the faith. Well, I think if he had three out of four believing children, that's okay. But if he has all unbelieving children, there is a defect somewhere in the home where the all, for all of his children would rebel. And it's not just the children responding to parental authority. It's uh, children responding to legitimate authority, uh, police officers, uh, school teachers. This would be legitimate authority. You know, any pastor can be... Um, kosher at a church meeting or a social or a public gathering, but how he lives with his family is so important in discerning 
his ability to lead the church of God. It's very difficult to lead the church well if things are, have gone south at home. And then not a recent convert. Now, when, Timoth when, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, remember the church is very new. The church is probably only 35 years old when Paul wrote this to Timothy. And so almost all the people were new converts. And so not a brand new convert would be important here. For example, um, I've noticed recently there are a lot of midlife change careers where a guy has uh, maybe been an engineer from uh, 18 to 40. And then at 40, he decides he wants to be a pastor, which is great because he brings experience by virtue of being 40 years old. But he doesn't bring experience as a pastor. He brings experience as a person working in the public venue, which, which is okay. But if he's a brand new convert, you know, maybe became a Christian at, eight, at 38, and then at 40 he decides to go into ministry, he's not seasoned enough. You know, this is another place where secular culture recognizes that if you're going to be a good electrician, you need to be mentored by an electrician. If you're going to be a good counselor, matter of fact, most states require these were things. If you're going to be a good counselor, you need to be mentored by a professional counselor. So one of the questions for candidate next would be, who has mentored you in the principles of local church ministry? A very important question for any potential candidate. So, uh, well thought of by outsiders, I think I mentioned uh, uh, in one of my first messages here that I thought it was so odd that Western Seminary, when I applied to the seminary, asked for two references from unchurched people. <laughs> well, I thought you'd ask a reference from my pastor, from my crusade director, from my fellow Christians. No, they wanted two references from unchurched people. My football coach and my sociology professor were the ones that I got letters from. And, and, but this is that reputation with outsiders is important. Because if you have no credibility in the community, then people are not going to attend the church. So as we consider these things together, pray for your search team that they'll have God's wisdom. And don't forget, in Romans chapter 12, many of these qualities are required of you as an average practicing Christian. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.